But if you have your Bibles with you again, I'm asking you to turn with me to Mark chapter 13 again. Entitled the message this morning, The Abomination of Desolation. Um, please pray for me. I'm still having a little trouble in my throat this morning, coughing a little bit, but I know the Lord will get us through this. The Abomination of Desolation. Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 23. Jesus and his disciples were sitting on the Mount of Olives. It was the end of the day, and he had just left the temple, and his disciples had followed him, and they were out on the eastern gate. They had went out of the eastern gate and down the little bank and across the Kinrod Valley, across the little stream and up the slope of the Mount of Olives, and he sat with his disciples, and they looked, and they saw the temple fading in the glow of the evening. And Jesus said this, this one thing. He said, not one stone will be left upon another as he looked there at the temple. And this prompted questions from the disciples. When will all these things be? They wanted to know. When will the destruction of the temple? What will be the signs when all these things are going to be fulfilled? They wanted to know about the end of the age. And in Matthew's account of this, he said that they asked about the end of the age and his coming. Then Jesus begins to tell them of the events that is to come. This morning we are going to be looking at one of those events right before he comes. It's called the abomination of desolation. It's going to be right in the middle of the tribulation. Let's go to uh, verse 14 of chapter 13 through 23. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let, let them that be in Judah flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house. And let, let him that is in, in the field not turn back again for the or to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that ye fight, that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened these, those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he shall shorten the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye take he heed, behold, I have foretold you all these things. Let us pray. Father in heaven. We come to you again today thanking you for your blessings of life. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace upon our lives. God, as we look at this precious word of God, I pray you enlighten us. Open our eyes and our hearts, Lord. Father, is it important for us to know this? Yes. Does it affect us? As a church, as believers in Christ, we will be gone, but we've got to think about those that we love. Lord, we do not want them to be left behind to face this kind of judgment. God, help us, Lord. Inspire us, Father, to serve you, to be a witness for you, to be faithful unto you, God, because I truly believe in, our, in my heart of hearts, Lord, that time is drawing nigh. And, Lord, so I pray, God, for our world. I pray for our nation. I pray for our neighborhoods. I pray for our families. God, we need soul-winning salvation, Lord, to take hold of our country and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. My first point is this, the abomination of desolation. That which was spoken by Daniel. When you see it where it ought not to be, as it tells here in the scripture, there in verse 14. For some time now, we have been following Jesus through the events of his life as, as they recorded in the Gospels. And we have spent the last four years, actually, following Jesus through his life here on Sunday mornings. But we have come to the last week of his life. He is on his way to the cross to give his life as a ransom. For our sins. He is on his way to die for the ungodly. And as he makes his way to Calvary, Jesus takes some time here to share some much needed truths with his disciples. 
He wants them to know some of the events that will occur in the end time as it approaches. And we see here in Mark chapter 13, Jesus gives some clear warnings of the events that will take place during the last days. In the verse before us today, Jesus pushes the calendar far into the future. In these verses, he takes us all the way to the middle of tribulation period, which is three and a half years into the tribulation. Jesus wants his people living in all ages to know that some tragic events are on the horizon. Jesus warns about the events of the time known as the Great Tribulation. The first three and one half years of the tribulation will be a time of relative peace. The church will be, be gone. Hallelujah, we will be gone, okay? Listen to me. We will be gone. If you are born again, child of God, member of God's family, you will be gone. And I love to read the verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 17. This is what it says about our departure. But I would not have you be ignorant, brother, concerning them that are asleep, that are ye sorrow not, those who have gone on in the grave, our loved ones, my mother, my father, my grandparents. See, it says here, I, I don't worry about them, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that which was alive and remain uh, uh, until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, hallelujah, with the voice of the, trump, of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Man, I'm looking for that moment. I, it, folks, it can happen before I get through preaching. If it does, hallelujah. Amen. I'm ready, aren't you? Amen. I hope you are. I hope you are. And this says, then we, uh, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall it ever be, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to going and be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. But folks, I want to tell you something. I, my heart goes out to those who are lost. My heart goes out to those who are not ready for that rapture to take place. My heart goes out to those of my family, uh, to my, my neighbors, to those that, that, I, that I know in all my relationship. I have many people that I know that are lost. Don't you? You have many people who are lost. So why do we need to concentrate? Preacher, if we're going to rapture, why do we even look, need to look about tribulation? Because we need to have a concern and a heart for those who don't know Jesus. We need to care about them, and we need to know what's going to happen after we're gone. There is going to be literal hell on earth. Do you want your loved ones to go through that? If you don't, you better start sharing Jesus. You want your coworkers to go through that? You better start sharing Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of people who are going to go through that. There's a lot of people think they're going to go to heaven, but you know what? They're going to miss it. Why? Because all they think is this, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. That's the key word today that the world is using. I'm a good person. No, you're not. Neither am I. The Bible says there's none but one that was good, and that was Jesus Christ. So the rest of us are lost, amen? amen. The rest of us are like filthy rags. There's none good, and we all need Jesus. I needed him. I thank God that he found me. He called me, and I would surrender to him, but the world needs him. Right. My family needs him. You need him. The church will be gone when this happens. We'll be in heaven with the Lord and we'll be having a hallelujah time. Amen. Amen. I can't wait to get up there. I can't wait to see some of my friends and loved ones up there that have gone on. I can't wait to see you up there. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Can't wait to see you up there getting all excited and acting foolish up there. <laughs> huh? That's what preachers say. We ought to get practice shouting because that's what we're going to do when we get there. It's all right. It's all right to get a little excited, amen? In the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination, the abomination of desolation will be seen standing where it ought not. What does that mean? What does it mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the abomination? That means something that's blasphemous, something distasteful, something sacrilegious, something that is irreverent. It is used in reference to immorality and adultery and paganism, uh, anything that abominates God, anything uh, uh, that blasphemes God, at the same time desolates and destroys and devastates. We can accurately identify the abomination of desolation 
as the Antichrist who will appear on the world stage during the tribulation. He will be the minister of Satan wrecking, hit, wreaking havoc and destruction upon earth, upon people's life. It is prophesied in Daniel and also revealed in Revelations. The Antichrist is going to establish the rule in Jerusalem in the temple. So here's the way it's going to go. This is the way I believe it's going to go to church. Any moment right now could go. Then guess what happened? Boy, they're going to really be ramping up, building up that temple. That temple's going to be built. And the Jews will think, man, it's right now. Everything's wonderful now. But they're going to be deceived. They're going to be so deceived by this Antichrist. They're going to be led away, and so are so many others. That, that terrible thing, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, tells us, describes the desolation here. Look what it says, I'll be about this. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. At this moment, the horrified Jews will know that they have been deceived, but it will be too late. The campaign of death and destruction will begin in earnest upon the earth. My next sub point, that which ought to flee, that which you ought to flee. Those in Judah are to run. Look what the scripture says. In the last part of verse 14, let them that are be in Judah flee to the mountains. The end of Christ will have his grip on power, ruling the world under direction of Satan himself. And while the entire world will be forced to deal with this devastation of the tribulation, Jesus speaks directly to those who are dwelling in Judah. He says to them, he says to the nation of Israel, although the end of Christ will not discriminate with his plan of this devastation and suffering, he will direct his anger straight at those Israelis, those Jews, the nation of Israel. He hates them, and he'll do everything to destroy him. So Jesus warns those who dwell in Israel at this time to flee from the mountain. You better get out of there is what he's saying. They will face an intense an especially hateful attack during the tribulation. They are to leave immediately. They are not to worry about their possessions, their personal property. A, a person is who is on the housetop, and we got to realize that uh, back then how they built houses, they actually built houses where the their, their top of the house was like a patio. And they would have stairs that led down in the middle of the house, and they also had stairs that led down on the outside of the house. And you know what Jesus says? This is going to be so bad. When this is revealed, don't bother to go back in the house. You get down. You go by the outside ladder and you head for the hills. Don't waste any time. And of course, farming is a lot different now. Now we got John Deere's. Then they had oxen. But he says, if you're at the end of the field and you lay the garment down because you got hot and sweaty and you lay the garment down in the field, don't take time to go back and get that garment. You better head for the hills. And then Jesus says here in verse 17, but woe to them that are with child. You know what he said there? He said, pity those that have, ch that have children. Why? Because the, the, the journey is going to be hard enough as it is. But to have a lady to have a, be pregnant and carrying a child to try to have to escape to get to the mountains or have a baby in their arms to have to get to that mountain, woe unto them because it's going to be hard. Pity on those. And then he says, you better do this. You better pray it doesn't come in winter. See that? He says, you better pray, pray that this does not happen in the winter months because it's going to make it even harder. It's hard enough as it is, but if it happens during the middle of winter, how much more devastating and hard it's going to be. Pray because those Palestine cold winters can be rough. Clear that we see in this warning of Jesus the, uh, the difficulty and the, and the desperation of the moment. Many today laugh and joke about hell and the end of times and, 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 and they don't believe it's going to happen, but I, they better get ready. I don't 
believe it's a laughing matter. Just look at our world stage. Just look at the things that are happening in our country today, in our own nation, that 50 years ago we would never have thought would ever happen. But yet it's happening. It's happening. We look in our quarterly. In our Sunday school lesson today, and on one page there, it talks about 63% of was Americans, or did, well, I can't remember what it was, 63% of the church or Americans one says that homosexuality is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. My second main point, that which has never been anything ever like it. Mm. The severity of it, verse 19. For in those days shall the affliction such as it was not from the beginning of creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. The severity of Jesus warns when the tribulation come, it will be a time of devastation, unlike the world has ever seen or experienced. It is a time of unrivaled suffering and wrath and uh, uh, nothing in the past or the future until the tribulation comes will match it. While the book of Revelation reveals great details from chapter 6 to ch chapter 16, it remains beyond our ability to really comprehend it. The time of tribulation will be more painful than any time before, like increasing labor pains. And a woman can understand that more than we men can. But it begins small and it begins and it increases. And it gets harder, more painful, and more rapid. It's going to be like that. Never anything like it since creation, he says. The old prophets had insight into, into times of, uh, of devastation, and, and yet they too were unable to fully grasp the enormity of what's going to transpire. And I'm convinced that, they're, they're, that humanity lacks the, uh, the vocabulary and the wisdom to truly comprehend the horror that is going to take place when this happens. We can look at our, our history, our world history, even our nation history, we can see some awful things happen. We go back to World War II, and we see what happened, the Holocaust with the Jews. We can go to those camps where millions were, were incinerated and, and, and burners and, and, and all kinds of things. And the Bible tells us that that don't even come close. We can see what has taken place uh, uh, through ISIS and Al-Qaeda and how, how merciless they have been and how cruel they have been uh, at killing Christians and anybody else who stands in their way or does not believe what they believe. We can go and we can look at pictures of what we did to Japan when we dropped those two bombs. How it incinerated people. How it left so much scar and destruction in those two cities in Japan. And yet the Bible says that's going to be nothing close to what's going to happen in the tribulation. That ought to scare us. Amen. Amen. That ought to open our eyes. That ought to awaken us to what's going to transpire. How scary it's going to be. Jesus declares that our world has yet to experience the suffering that will endure in the tribulation. It is a time of deadly destruction. Satan is let loose. Demons are let loose. Satan and demons do terrible damage to people. Uh, terrible destruction, uh, destructive damage uh, and death that, that's just unheard of. And the Antichrist shows up and the false prophets show up. The Antichrist takes over and, and, and dominates the world with his power. And he's aided and abetted by demons and those men who follow him in their army. It will be a horrible world never seen before. That's what the Bible says. So can we even comprehend it? Absolutely not. But if we would just stop and look at what the atrocities that took place to the Jews, we stop and we look at what those bombs did in, in, in Japan or those two cities, it ought to open our hearts and our eyes and our minds, and we ought to be concerned for those who are lost. Who could face that. Man, I'll tell you what, I've I got so many in my family, I, I don't even know their all their names. I know my brother said, my God, I don't even. We've got great nephews and nieces. My God, if they come, all come, come together, I wouldn't even know who they belong to. But you know what scares me? I believe that most of them's lost. I believe most of them don't know Jesus. Huh. 
Well, I also know is they don't. They ain't gonna listen to Preacher Jeff or Uncle Jeff. But I pray every day that somebody reach them for Christ's sake. Somebody reach them. Pray that somebody get to your family. If they won't listen to you, you pray that God open the door. That he'll put somebody in their face. They'll listen to them. Next sub point, the sovereignty shown in it. Verse 20. Look what he says here. And except the Lord hath shortened those days, no flesh shall be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And except the Lord hath shortened those days. Sovereignty means supreme power of authority. Now I want you to know that hell's going to break loose on earth. It's going to be broke loose for seven years. But I want you to know God's still in control. Amen. You see, he put a time limit on it. Seven years. Didn't he? <coughs> That's right. Seven years. He owned it. He's got time. It's devil. You can have it. This is your time limit. So the tribulation will result in mankind's utter rebellion. The reason it's happened is because of rebellion of God and the rejection of the gospel. What grace is, uh, when grace is rejected, wrath and judgment are, are all that remains. And one cannot argue that God would be just in destroying all of creation for its rebellion. Again, let's, let's look at the world situation and tell me we don't deserve to be judged. I don't know about you, but one of the things that upset me about this past week with our new president is his executive order for our tax money to go everywhere, all over the world, to, to provide abortions for murdering of innocent children. I hope you didn't vote for that. I hope you didn't vote for that. And I, I didn't see how 80 million people voted for that. For the destruction of babies in their womb. Heard somebody say this past week, said, finally, finally, after four years, I got, I got hope and peace. And I'm going, where's the hope and the peace for the unborn child? Where's the hope and the peace for the unborn child? God help our nation. God help our world. In fact, we don't deserve the mercy and the favor of God. However, Jesus revealed that even in the wrath, God will show mercy and grace. The world could know, not endure is what it means. It cannot endure an extended period of destruction like this that has transpired within the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And in those days, we're not limited. If they weren't limited, there would be no flesh left. So God has set a bound on time regarding the tribulation. Some believe that, that this speaks of the uh, supernatural shortening of the days uh, during the tribulation. Well, I just say this. I have no doubt God can do whatever he pleases, but I believe it speaks merely of a predetermined dur uh, duration, and, and that's it. God said you got three and a half years. This is it. You ain't going past it. The preacher, what's going to stop it? <laughs> it's very simple. He's coming back. That's going to be the end of it. God will be merciful for the elect's sake here. This is some, there's some debate about who the elect is. Some contend that it speaks of the, the nation of Israel being elect, God's covenant people. Others contend it speaks of the, uh, those who uh, receive the gospel or are saved during the tribulation. I have no problem with either or, or believing it. Both of them. It speaks of both. Whatever the case, God will show mercy in the midst of the wrath and judgment. And again, how's it going to stop? He's coming back. He's coming back. My next main point. Seduction like never before will occur in it. The seduction in it. Look at what it says here in verse 21. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe them not. Believe them not. When men are oppressed and, and, and oppressed, witnessing scene after scene of, of death by starvation, pestilence, murder, and war, they are, they're crying for a deliverer. They are ever so open to a deliverer arising on the scene 
that they'll follow anything. And some of them are, uh, are always ready. There's always somebody ready to assume power and leadership. Jesus gives his men a final warning here as he's there with those disciples concerning the end time. He warns them that many false Christs will, will present themselves and attempt to lead even the elect astray. The deception will be so strong even the elect will be deceived if it were possible. Now you notice I said if it were possible, but when the bottom falls out of the world and people are, te uh, are terrified by the things going on around them, uh, uh, they will be easily prayed, they're easily preyed upon by these false messiahs. They will be looking for hope wherever they can find it, and some will, will be led astray by false promises of salvation. So during the tribulation, the false prophet will create an image of the Antichrist and place it in the temple in Jerusalem, and he will cause that statue to come alive, and many will fall for it, many will believe in it, many will surrender to it. And how sad that's going to be. That's in Revelation chapter 13. The time period will be one great spiritual deception and turmoil. Many will be led to their damnation because they refuse the truth. Mm. False deliverers will be so convincing they will threaten even the elect. The elect, of course, are genuine believers. They endure for Jesus regardless of the circumstance or trial. Preacher, who do you, who do you think will make up uh, uh, the majority of this elect? I believe a lot of them is going to be the left behind church members. <laughs> I believe when the rapture is gone, when God comes for his children and we go home to be with him, and I'm looking forward to that. The Bible says we'll meet him in the air. We'll be going home and he'll be coming to join us. He'll be coming to meet us. You know, I get a little, like Graham said, the prodigal son. Amen. The father ran to meet him, didn't he? We're going to meet him in the air. What a time we're going to have. What a celebration we're going to have. But those left behind, those church members who, who went to church all their life and thought they were all right because mom and daddy were saying, Thought they were all right because they were raised in church but never had a time in their life where they fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God realizing that they were sinners and headed for a devil's hell. You never realize you're a sinner? You're lost. You're lost. I don't care what anybody says. You're lost. Because you can't get saved till you get lost. That's right. Nobody's going to ask for Jesus in their heart. They don't think they need him. Hmm. Friend, there's going to be a massive number of people left behind that went to church. The question is, are you one of them? The question is, are you going to be one of them left behind? You ever watch any of those left behind series? Left behind. But Jesus gives us a warning. Jesus tells us, look at the, uh, our second sub point here is the, the, the he that is needed. He says, take heed. Jesus said, take heed. Behold, I have warned you. And so this amazing, again, this wonderful scripture of God, he's talking to, to his people, he's talking to you and I, he's talking to the church. He says, I'm warning you. So if you're left behind, it ain't my fault. I'm telling you what's going to happen. If you don't receive me, if you don't accept the gospel, if you don't take heed, you're in trouble. Sad, the truth is, many in our own day are being led astray by false prophets and false teachers. Jesus said, take heed to what's happening around you. The cults are flourishing while Bible-believing churches seem to be dying. The Mormons, the Jehovah Witness, and other cult groups are preaching their doctrine and being accepted by multitudes. They are gaining acceptance because they preach a message of acceptance and other people false hope and offer people false hope there's the health and health and wealth preachers there's the easy believism preachers touched on that last week there's so much of that it makes me puke Jesus loves you and you're wonderful they don't tell you Jesus loves you and you need to repent they don't tell you Jesus loves you but you better come out of the blood 
They say, Jesus loves you, and you're wonderful. You're amazing. I'm telling you. That's some of the things that are being said and shared. You're wonderful, and you're amazing, and Jesus wants you to have a mansion and a drive a Cadillac and a big old bank roll of money. Still ain't figured that out how to preach that when we see what happened to his disciples. Now, if his disciples got all that, then I'd say, okay, I'm ready for it too. But that wasn't what his disciples got, was it? Absolutely not. Jesus has not left us unprepared and in the dark. He wants us to know God is still on the throne and God will not uh, uh, be taken by surprise when the abomination of desolation arises. We can have confidence and be assured of eternal deliverance no matter the terrible affliction coming upon this earth. The world is not, is not getting better. It is absolutely getting worse, more scarier, more threatening, more dangerous, more deadly, more hopeless. Humanity is not headed toward a human-engineered utopia. Folks, there is no age of Aquarius. There is no coming time of world peace. There is a cursed planet in which we live on. And we're, it is a cursed place because of sin. It is a cursed place because of sin. And the Bible tells us that even creation groans because of our sins. I think that we can all agree that this is a very sobering passage we just looked at. Jesus spoke prophetic words that will be fulfilled according to the sovereign plan of God. Every word Jesus spoke will be, will be carried out just as he said. The world will face unknown and unprecedented wrath and devastation. The tribulation will be a time of suffering and despair for the world. We look at world events and we look at our national events and we say, how can this be? How can this be? I want you to know that God has a predetermined time that when he's coming for his church and when the rapture is going to take place, I'm telling you, when tribulation starts, God knows. And, that, and all these things that have to transpire before it to come about. And it's coming about really fast. You know, there has to be peace in the Middle East. And there was a lot of that taking place under Donald Trump. God putting the puzzle together. Amen. Things are happening. Things are happening. There has to be a disregard for human life, and we see that in the fact of abortion. More people think now it's just health care. <laughs> Can you believe it? That's a big deception, isn't it? Have you noticed that all through the preaching here of Jesus at the end time has been about really about deception? People are so deceived. Why? Because they don't know the truth. They don't know God's word. So they're easily deceived. No wonder we have all these so-called liberals that believe it's okay to kill babies. It's okay to, to, for men to marry men and women to marry women. It's okay to do all this crazy, you know, this transgender mess. Oh, as you know, there's another thing that just galled me. Our new president signed an executive order saying that transgenders can compete in women's sports. So if you got a daughter that's athletic, she might have to run a race against a boy. How fair is that? No, it's just disgrace and abominable. It's just sickening, isn't it? Amen. God help us. Here, I'm going to wind this thing up. The question of the hour today is this. Have you been saved by the grace of God? Have you realized your need for Christ, repented of your sins, and believed that he died to pardon your iniquity, your sins? And that he rose again the third day for justification. If not, I urge you to respond. I urge you to respond in repentance and faith today unto salvation in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray today, if you're saved, I pray the message will create a desire within you to share the gospel. I pray that when you look at this, you say, man, that's going to be a horrible time. I look at this and I, I say, man, I'm glad I'm going, but I, my heart goes out to those who are lost. And what am I going to do about it? 
I must tell them that Jesus loves them, yes, but I also must tell them that they are filthy rags. In other words, that they are sinners, that they are lost. They have lied. They have committed murder in their heart. They are sinners, and they need salvation. They need somebody to take their place. They need a redeemer, and that's Jesus. Friend, according to all that I understand about the Word of God, there's no reason that Jesus cannot come right now for his church. Are you ready? Are you ready? Amen. I hope so. I pray so. Do you know anybody that's not? Do you know anybody that's not? What can you do to help get them ready? I want to tell you something. The greatest accomplishment you can ever do is point somebody to Jesus. Are you listening? You can come up with a medicine that'll cure cancer, but I want to tell you something. Getting people to heaven is better than curing cancer because everybody's going to die. If it ain't by cancer or COVID-19, you're going to die. We've got a job to do. We've been warned. We need to get busy. Sister, will you come and play? Will you stand this morning? As she plays, if you need to come to this altar this morning, I beg you to come. If you understand what's going to happen in the future, and it scares you for those who are lost, will you come? If you're lost yourself, will you come? You need Jesus. You need to get right with the Lord. You need to accept Him as the Savior of your life. Will you come right now as she plays? Right now, will you come? Maybe you got somebody on your heart and mind right now. You know it's lost. Maybe there's somebody on your heart and mind right now. You know that if the church is gone, they're going to be left behind. Do you want that? Do you want any of your family left behind? Do you want any of your co-workers left behind? Will you come right now and pray? If you need salvation, will you come right now? I'll stand here at the front and I'll pray with you. Would you come? I want to tell you this. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he went to the cross of Calvary to pay for your sins and you are a sinner. Don't let anybody tell you. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Will you come right now? come this morning thanking you Father for your precious and most holy word God we know it to be the truth we know Lord that the church is going to leave this place soon and we know Father God that hell on earth is going to begin but Father we know this too that many we love will be left if we don't get busy if we don't do all we can Lord to reach them with the gospel Father, it's our duty, Lord, to share, to reach out in love, to share the truth with people, not false hopes, but the truth. God, every soul is lost without you. Every soul needs you. Father, forgive us where we fail thee. And Father, I pray that anybody under the sound of my voice, if they're lost, oh God, I pray that they now, this moment, upon bending knees and lifting their heart to you, that they, Father, ask that forgiveness and ask Lord, you to come into their heart and their life. God, the greatest gift of all is the gift of salvation. It only comes through Jesus. I pray that every soul get that gift. Without it, Lord, it's hell to pay. May they understand that. In Jesus' sweet and holy name, amen.